Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by Harold John Laborte, the founder, vice chairman, and CEO of Capilli Trading Inc. and Matter of Trust Philippines. Capilli Trading, founded in 2021, transforms waste human hair into valuable byproducts for industries like agriculture and fashion, aiming for social, environmental, and economic impact. Harold holds a degree in business economics from Xavier University and is completing his master's in urban and regional planning at UP Diliman. I've asked Harold to join us here today to share his story and insights in the future, on the future of innovation and sustainability. So Harold, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Hi, Dario. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes. I'm doing great. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for considering it's us. It's good to have you here. Now, how did you even get started? First off, it's a very innovative thing. Uh, that you're working on now. And I want to get into that, but you, you went to school for business. Is this like a family trade? Do you come from a family of entrepreneurs? Actually, my parents are not into business, but my dad always shared to me that my grandfather, my dad's father, is actually into business, uh, was actually into business. He used to introduce public transportation here in the city when during its early days, but it's no longer existing. Right. So definitely within my direct family, I'm the only one who's into business while my parents and my brother are not. And so did you get into this at a young age? Were, were you selling Tahoe on the street as a kid? What, how did you get into business? Did you first do academia or what was your business? What did your business career look like? Yeah. So basically the reason why I was into business school, because I really love to go into business, mm -hmm. even since I was still a kid. Maybe what formed me is how I was always being elected in classrooms mm -hmm. as the leader. It's always satisfying to actually have a goal in your class, in your classroom, way back in elementary, high school, and even college, and then help my classmates achieve a goal. And I think that's that helped me form who I am today and venture into business as well. Got it. So is this your first business venture or have you been involved in other businesses? Between then and now? Uh, right after college, I was working with different companies. Uh, one of them is also a startup. But this is actually uh, my first business venture. Kapiti is actually my first business venture. And how did you get the idea? Again, I think it's great. I, there's, I'm going to let you answer because obviously this is your interview. But I was really inspired when I was a teen because I heard about Ziri, Zero Emissions Research Institute, which was uh, a division once upon a time of the United Nations because there was a German guy who had built a car wash and a, a microbrewery that had no waste products. Like the brewery used the leftover hops from making beer to grow mushrooms and feed chickens. No, he to, to feed chickens and the poop from the chickens to grow mushrooms. Like the thing was powered by a water wheel by the river. Like the whole thing was just like a machine, like a clock. And there were no, in his car wash was the same way. And so I was always fascinated by that. And that's part of what piqued my interest was what you're doing. Back to you. How did you even get the idea of turning, yeah, I'm gonna, turning waste hair into a product? Yeah. Fun, fun history is that the concept behind Kapili or the concept behind the use of human hair as a raw material actually started when I was still in high school. It was actually my science thesis <laughs> at that time in our city. By the way, I'm based here in Mindanao in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So for those who's listening and not familiar about Iligan City, we're located at the south of the Philippines. So basically at that time, more than 10 years ago, there was actually a wide banning of plastics mm -hmm. to be used in commercial establishments. You mm -hmm. cannot use plastics for packaging. Mm -hmm. So the government banned it, the local government banned it. When I was still in high school, I was tasked to do a research to have alternatives for plastics uh, as, a, as a means for packaging material. Okay. So my research uh -huh. back then was the use of hair as a raw material for, for packaging. It's because of our tensile strength, right? So if you try to, to pick your hair, uh, at least a strand of your hair, and try to break it, it's actually very difficult uh, just breaking it with your own hand, right? Because okay. there are certain weights that you can actually carry with the use of your hair. So that's how I started. That was my study. But of course, Daryl, when you're still in high school, right, you have right. a different mindset. You just want to graduate and you want to go to college, right? So right. I totally forgot everything about it. 
and then fast forward 2021 so i was in i was doing my science research in high school around 20 if i'm not mistaken around 2000 to 2011 and then fast forward to 2021 at the height of pandemic so i was actually working in manila in the capital hmm. and then it's because it's pandemic i decided to go back to my hometown to right. spend more time with family right and then i decided no longer to go back to, to manila so i wanted to settle back here in my hometown right. and then start my own business so i was actually looking over my different list of potential businesses that i wanted to start here in my hometown when suddenly i browsed on my high school thesis manual it's because I always keep my notes. Even when I was still in high school, in elementary, I always keep them in one corner in the house. And then I suddenly saw my manual. So I tried, I just tried to open it. And I was curious, what's happening already with human hair? Are there any innovations that have been made? So I tried to Google them. And I was shocked that in other parts of the world, like in US and in Europe, they've been doing a lot already in terms mm. of human hair. They have been innovating human hair for different industries. So at the same time, I was also disappointed in myself. Why? Because it could have been me who started it years ago, <laughs> right? Uh, I could have introduced it already. I could have started it. But the good catch here is that here in Southeast Asia and here in the Philippines, no one is still doing it. Right. So that became my mission to, to inform everyone that, hey, your waste has a lot of potential. Your human hair has a lot of potential. It can change the world. So here we are in Kapili. So that's how we, we do things in Kapili. So we partner with communities. Uh, we do a social enterprise model because for us to introduce this innovation, we don't only want to profit on it personally, but we want to bring in communities as well to grow with us. So yeah, uh, that's Kapili in, in, in its history. So I love it. I wouldn't beat yourself up too much. They say the pioneers get the arrows, the settlers get the land. So it's okay to follow versus be the one that, that found it. So can you explain for people that maybe are bewildered by this idea, what are some of the types of things you can do with what's typically human hair waste? Yeah, actually in other countries, they have already started the use of human hair of the, the most common one is fashion, right? You trade your hair to fashion because of hair wig, hair extensions. But some of the unique industries, like for example, construction, they have actually infused human hair because of its tensile strength for concrete reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. They have also used a human hair for textile. So I think there's a company in Netherlands wherein they actually converted your human hair into different types of clothing. But of course, with the right science, it's no longer yuck, right? right? Right. People might think that when it comes to human hair, why are you putting hair in my clothes? But of course, no, with the right I mean, innovation, been, with the right most, science. Most right? fabrics have come from wool. That's correct, like, correct. Yeah, so that's not, <laughs> people got to get over that. Uh, yeah, and then there are also certain uh, chemicals that you can extract from hair that can be used for food preservation. And there's a lot more. But here in Kapili, right now, what we're doing is that we've been using human hair for pollution remediation and for agriculture. So when we talk about pollution remediation or waste treatment, it's because our hair can actually absorb uh, oil for oil spills. Oh. Uh, and I think it's a proven fact already. There are, there's a lot of scenarios already wherein we've been using hair to absorb oil during oil spills in the oceans. The most recent one was last year in Mindoro. It's a huge incident, Mindoro oil spill here in the Philippines. And we actually donated around 600 kilograms uh, of human hair to the affected community. And we partner with an organization to help them convert it into oil absorbent booms. Uh, to help for the cleanup uh, during the oil spill. Aside from that, oil spills don't only happen in the oceans, but it can also happen on land. For example, in your facilities, like in your uh, manufacturing facility area, wherein there are leakages from your machines or equipments, right? So that uses fuel or uses oil. So it's used to treat it. At the same time, it also absorbs certain chemicals as well. So that's how we use hair for waste treatment. And for agriculture, the best part about agriculture is that our human hair contains a lot of nitrogen, which is actually good for the plants. So it acts as a natural fertilizer and it helps retain your moisture content. It's actually very good. And it's actually, we're currently, we're doing a research and we found out certain, our initial findings is that we tried to infuse human hair for, for a hydroponic setup. And we compare it with soil 
And the best results is in around nine to 12 days of sowing, we were able to grow seedlings with the use of water and hair only. Uh, the growth rate is around 80 to 95% versus soil, uh, which is around 20 to 25% only. So, so I, that's I the beauty hydroponics. of hair. I've got 144 plant hydroponic stand. Are you saying I should start nice. over the water bucket? Is that what I need to do? Or just need to start shaving <laughs> over top of no, it? Uh, no, we actually, we have a machine wherein we can actually form a structure or a design for your hair so that it holds its felt within each other. So yeah. That's fantastic. That kind of makes sense. I love concepts like this. So is there a, I guess, are you partnering with a lot of barber shops? I imagine they're just like hair factories for you that you just, yeah. Is that uh, we partnered with uh, salons and barbershops in the city. So right now we have almost 80 partners. So it's, it's a form so of social hair. advocacy as well, Daryl, because we wanted to teach them to divert their waste from the landfill. So right. we want to teach them how to segregate properly the human hair. And at the same time, uh, since we're on a social enterprise model, we want them to benefit as well from this process. Like for every waste, that they trade with us, they get incentives. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty as well of social entrepreneurship. You don't only grow as a business, but you also help the community grow. Yeah, I love that. I love that. It's You're fitting into a web. I, I think that's great. You're turning someone else's trash into a treasure. Correct, and, correct. And the renewable resource, because I know at least me, I need to go get a haircut once, twice. So I think that's, I think that's fantastic. What are some of the future trends that you're seeing in the health industry? If or What are you watching and paying attention to in terms of, sorry, not health, I, hair industry? Because like you mentioned, there are different trends, different emergence. What are you most excited about when it comes to using human hair? Actually, we have a lot in our pipeline to explore about human hair. The beauty with the human hair is that it's everywhere. Right. <laughs> in terms yeah. of people talk about in business, if you talk about supply demand, in terms of supply, hair is there uh, anywhere. <laughs> body hair the hair. same as head hair? Is there a difference between body hair or head hair? Because I have uh, a we're friend. Only using, he, we're only he, using head hair. <laughs> oh, okay. I was going to say, I have a friend. Yeah. He could, we, we call him Wolverine. He could probably take care of a whole town. He's just <laughs> such a hairy guy. Okay. So what's the difference <laughs> between head hair and body hair then? Actually, there's no, there's not much difference, but with head hair, at least it's a bit cleaner. Cleaner, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah and yeah, longer. Yeah. You get, you're getting yeah, more. Yeah, longer. Again. Yeah, well. you're getting more. Yeah, and it's easy to collect because when you go to salons and barbershops, people will have their hair cut directly from the head, not from your butt. Right, so, right, right. yeah, so we're using, so we have a lot of product are indeed in the pipeline. So we wanted to introduce them. So right now, aside from pollution remediation, waste treatment, and agriculture, we're looking at the use of human hair for thermal insulation system to be three to five years from now. We have partnered with another organization for this one. And then we use we, we are supposed to start prototyping our human hair to be converted to paper last mm. year. But since we're currently fundraising for an equipment, we actually move it in our calendar. But yeah, uh, a potential of human hair to be used as a specialty paper for secondary packaging material. It's the same as my research way back in high school, right? For a packaging material. Right. But with this one, we're infusing it for paper. So right. yeah. I love that. So let me, I want to go back to the construction uses because you talked about using it with cement and also you said just now thermal insulation but doesn't hair isn't hair biodegradable isn't that a, an issue if you build your building with human hair and then it turns to dirt in five years how do you how, yeah yeah oh basically to clarify the human hair is just used as a reinforcement so what does that mean but it's not actually the total the of total course. product yeah it's just course, to reinforce the concrete yeah. But what is, so it's put into the mix, isn't it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's put into the mix, correct. That's what I'm saying. So what, is there a way to try to reduce, is the benefit of human hair in these products is it's by, obviously, I guess with the oil spills and the agriculture, the fact that it's biodegradable is a huge asset. But that's what I'm saying. Is that a challenge? If I'm going to use it for insulation for my house, is that a challenge? Is this something that I'd have to replace every few years, do you think? Or I'm just asking, I'm not trying to put yeah, you on the yeah. spot, but. Yeah, okay. Got it, okay. So yeah, definitely you need to replace it because hair eventually will start to decompose already. Right. Right. But the good part here is that if you are to dispose your hair, you can only just put it in your plants back. 
for nitrogen and for fertilizer. I, there's a lot of bahe kubos for people that don't know. It's a common thing here. Their their houses made out of bamboo, and I'm not sure what kind of leaves it is, but it's like a thatched. It's a thatched roof essentially, which are leaves, and that that biodegrades too. So the bahe kubos got to you have to replace the the roof every few years. No, I was just asking because I wasn't sure if you're saying that you found some way to treat it. Now it's it doesn't. I, I didn't know about that. What are some of the biggest challenges in terms of being a social, following the social enterprise model? The biggest challenge would always be about, especially if you're dealing with human hair as your product, right? I was actually entry to market because you're using human hair. No one at first knows about it, right? Mm -hmm. Here in the Philippines, my perspective is here in the Philippines. So there's always a challenge, but there's always that curiosity from the people. So when we had this kind of booth expo in one of the malls, so we actually displayed our products. So the first, the first, the first thing that people have come into mind is that why are you using hair? So if there's a yuck factor. What is that hair? But then when you start explaining, then the questions come in and their curiosity comes in. And then now they try to understand, oh, wow, there's a possibility with my human hair. Right. So that's how that's in terms of marketing. That's one of the challenges when we started Kapili, because you're trying to convince people that human hair although they're already sanitized on our part, actually has a lot of potential. And this is not something that you should be afraid of to touch right, uh, right, because it's right. other people's hair, right? Uh, I think that's one of the challenges. The second one is that since we're dealing with the community as a social enterprise, there's a pressure from us to actually, to actually already find clients or sales because the community that you're working with can also benefit from it. So it's, if, we cannot, if we cannot make money, uh, the community partners doesn't have anything else as well. Right. So it's it's an added pressure for us and entrepreneurs that, hey guys, we need to step up and we need to fast track our processes, our sales, because we have a community that we're working with. We're not only talking about the salons and barbershops, but right. because we're also partnered with a community of mothers. Uh, these are unemployed women and unemployed mothers who's actually using the technology we acquired from the US. So they are actually the one who manages the machine so that it can be so that the human hair can be converted into something so we're working with different communities for this one yeah so keeping that's, sales that's coming through we... the door what's the bigger biggest advantages so let's go through the two primary use cases that i think are large scale projects for a lot obviously going back to the oil spills that's a large scale project typically what is the competitive advantage? Why? Okay, I like the sustainability of it, but at the end of the day, I've got a budget. I've got a big emergency on my hand. Why would I use your product versus some the conventional method? Correct, correct. By the way, just to give context, right now, in right now, uh, the field of uh, oil adsorption, there's only one product in the market, oh. and they are made of synthetic plastics. Mm. So basically, That's they are effective. Good. They pose significant environmental challenges due to their uh, non-biodegradable nature. So basically, uh, what we offer with our product is that we can also do what they can do, but it's actually better. We do not only match the performance of these oil plastic bills based sorbents, but we also offer the environmental benefits I've shared to you. So the good thing about human hair, the use of human hair for oil adsorption is that First, it's adsorbent capacity. It okay. can actually carry six to nine times its weight, which is actually better than the plastic or synthetic one. Like, for example, wow. if your oil adsorbent is made from human hair is one kilogram, it can actually carry six to nine times kilogram. So it's, it's adsorbent capacity, plus it can adsorb faster than any polypropylene booms. And then it costs cheaper. Why? Because it's human hair. It's not, you don't need to manufacture a lot. You don't need to do synthetic plastic manufacturing. You just get human hair. You form it into a structure and put it in your design. Right. So that's why that's why our pricing right now is 25% cheaper than right. what's currently available in the market. And it's very sturdy. Again, because of the tensile strength of human right. hair. I, I love that. Now, is it absorbent for any liquid or oil specifically? Oil, fuel, and any other chemicals as well. Chemicals, okay. Hydropanels, so yeah. So it wouldn't work in diapers because that's just urine. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. no. I was asking because I didn't, yeah, I didn't know. Okay. So that's a huge benefit because it's not a synthetic plastic. It's cheaper. It's maybe as strong or stronger. And then again, the fact that you can move it, put it and treat it better, I think, because you don't have all this plastic. You don't have to worry about microplastics. You're just yeah, trying to correct, treat correct. it. 
And there's actually, there's different microbes and I believe even some mushrooms that have been used to treat different types of oil and even nuclear waste. And so this would be actually a great medium for that. So I think that's fantastic. Now, how about with yeah. fertilizer? Let's talk about agriculture. Why would I care? Why would I go buy the human hair versus the thing that I normally buy? Because it's still better. So the one that's currently used right now in the Philippines for this kind of activities, we have a coco peat. I'm not sure if you're familiar with coco yep. peat, yep. right? Yep. Coco sawdust. So actually, it works better, again, because human hair has nitrogen. And it can do, it can retain moisture content compared to the cocoa peat. So yeah, that's the beauty. And you let it decompose as well. So it's a natural fertilizer. It's biodegradable as well. Okay. So what's the nitrogen content of hair? What do I, if somebody here is a garden and they like, how much hair do I need to use to get whatever? Like now I just get the bottle and it's whatever, it's whatever those numbers are versus human hair. Is it less... You know what I'm trying to say? If I'm trying to, that's really, yeah, really it. How do you go about dosing? Is that something like, how do you measure how much nitrogen you're giving your plants? I guess you don't have to worry about nitrogen burn either. That's something with a lot of chemical fertilizers. There's nitrogen burn. It burns all the plants. It'll, if it's too close to the roots, it can hurt the plant. Mm -hmm. Fertilize. You're not going to have that with human hair. I guess there's a natural slow release, an organic, you could say an organic Correct. Correct. release of nitrogen over time with human hair. Correct, correct. How do you go about measuring how much? Or is it because it's naturally released, it almost doesn't matter and you just pile it all in? Yeah, we actually haven't measured it yet, like how many nitrogen have been released. But yeah, because it's organic, we just let it there. We will let yeah. it decompose yeah. in, in your soil. It's like cow manure. They're not, when they spray a field with cow manure, they're not measuring how much is getting to each plant. They're just spraying the manure everywhere. It's fair enough. I think that is fair. I think that's such a great, it's a great thing. How close to the roots does it have to be? Do you, are you putting it on as a mulch? Is it? Having... Uh, yeah, it's a mulch. So you can actually, there are two case scenarios. It's either you have these indoor plants, the potted plants. So we have designs, these circular designs wherein you can actually put the mat on top of your soil, or you can also put it below the soil if, if it's a potted plant. But of course, if you are in a wider agricultural area, you don't need the circles, the circle right. design, but you need the wider mats. Right. So you can just put it on top of your soil. So yeah. And it actually helps you with your weeding problems. Right. Uh, it's and for any pest or any animals that would just go over to your plants, so it would avoid them because of the human hair. What do you mean? That's I think that's a huge added bonus. So is it a natural deterrent for pests? Correct, correct, yeah. How? Why? Tell me more. There's this kind of, I'm, I'm not sure with the term, I forgot the term, but it's, they don't go to you because of your hair, something like that. Like, they for example, yeah, maybe, I'm not sure if they smell something from the hair, that's why they cannot go like the normal pest. Or, and even the animals like stray dogs, right? If you have stray dogs in your farm, or let's say any other kind of animals that would go and destroy your plants. So they would try to avoid that. Really? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's why it's good for your weeding problems, for your pest control, and then for your any stray animals who want to destroy your crops, something like that. Wow, that's very interesting. And then how is it on pricing? Is it about the same? What's the price difference between conventional fertilizer and human hair fertilizer? Oh, but we do not recommend to only use human hair as your only fertilizer. You can still use that. It's just that this is more of a support. It's an added support because, again, maybe in, in other organic fertilizers, they have these certain nutrients as well right. that is needed for the plants. So, What's the mineral density? Do you know what the mineral composition is of hair? What kind of minerals are, we get, are they getting? Um, we do have, but I don't have it in my hand right now. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm asking but... impromptu questions. I suppose I was like, yeah. if you're going to say that there's a lot of magnesium in hair, I'm like, could you imagine a magnesium health supplement? Like just hair capsules that you eat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's it, mineral is a mineral, right? Whether it's from hair or rocks or who knows where else they get it. People take collagen and that's crushed up fish scales. So got it. Now, let me ask another thing is that, so we're talking about future trends. You talked about thermal insulation, paper, finding alternative uses. I guess with the big push to sustainability, is it mostly oil spills in agriculture that you feel? Or are there other, what do you think? Maybe I'm asking a question if you already answered, but what do you feel are the biggest opportunities for using hair that people don't realize right now? I, I would still go for oil spills because it's a very expensive incident. 
So whenever there are oil spills, it costs the government millions uh, or billions. And we're not only talking about public oil spills, oil spills that can also happen in your working areas, in your facilities. Right. right. And aside from that, the goal really here is that why do we need human hair to entrap special chemicals or oils? Because we don't want them to go directly to our bodies of water. Of so I think that's the best benefit that we can have with our waste hair to help the government, to help the companies as well, to treat the, to treat their waste properly before it goes to our water, regardless if it's an oil spill or no. Uh, as long as you can capture it early on before it goes to the drainage, then it's actually a total big help already. Right. And for agriculture as well, basically, if your area is actually very scarce in terms of uh, water, then definitely this, this actually helps because of its moisture content capability. Mm -hmm. So it helps hold the temperature, the moisture, we can act, which, which can actually help you grow your plants, your crops. So let's go, can you, because we talked about oils, what are some of the other chemicals that it, it absorbs? Because it didn't, it's not, it doesn't absorb water. I'm even thinking, because you talked about agriculture, there's a lot of runoff, livestock, wastewater. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is this something that could be used potentially to help treat that? To a certain, obviously it wouldn't be for drinking water, but there's a lot of livestock ranches where they've just got huge sludge ponds that are just eventually getting back to the water table. I'm just curious, what are the chemicals that you're aware of that hair really helps capture? Yeah, so basically it can capture iron, any iron waste. It can also capture some hydrophenols and even fatty oils in your restaurant. That's why you can actually use our mats. If you own a restaurant, maybe it's a big restaurant or maybe a restaurant just on the road. That's what we call here in the Philippines a calenderia, if, if you're familiar, right? Basically, soap greases or even the fatty oils. So it actually can still cause pollution problems. Uh, so before, before you before you dispose it to any bodies of water directly to the oceans or to the river. So why not try to capture it with the use of your map? So it actually helps a lot in terms of in, in terms of cleaning our water. So yeah, fatty oils. Yeah, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. So can you share some of the insights into the culture and values? You talked a bit about social entrepreneurship and being a contributor. You're providing employment to stay-at-home moms, you're trying to connect the salons and allow them to, instead of pay to have waste taken away, but actually turn it into a profit center. You're working with local government units and maybe larger organizations and agencies in, in terms of trying to, trying to clean up environmental waste. Can you speak to a little bit about the culture and values that drive your organization? It's always our commitment to society and the environment. I think that's what keeps us together. We came from different backgrounds. Me and my founders came from different backgrounds. So you have urban planning, you have law, you have business, marketing. Actually, no one in the team is actually into science. Mm. Uh, again, the, 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 the concept of human hair is just because of my high school thesis. But no one is actually majored in science. No one was actually exposed to the hair care industry. No one had been working there. But what kept us together, what keeps us together right now is that because there's a potential for this waste to actually make a difference. Right. So it's it's more of a commitment uh, to a society. Like we do have our own daytime jobs, but why are we doing this? Because we believe that we can make a difference. Own things in our own capacity with the use of just human hair, we can make our difference for the society and for the environment. And I think that's the biggest value, the, the strongest value that we have right now uh, as a team. And that keeps us moving forward. Right. Yeah. Right. That's really exciting. I'm very interested in this and seeing how this project goes. I love this idea. It makes me feel like we also need to talk about hemp more because hemp, something like an acre of, of hemp can produce 10 times what an acre of trees can produce. And it's more, it has better utility. I just think as a species, as a civilization, we need to try to sh throw off the shackles of either the status quo where it's not the best solution available. And we just need to be smarter about how we do things. I feel like we have everything that we need right now today to solve the majority of the world's issues, but don't because of things like crony capitalism and parasitic entities that are sitting fat in certain. And now I'm getting off. I'm going on a soapbox rant here about the injustices of the world, so to speak. But I do feel right. that we need to push 
more towards meritocracy. And I'm a big advocate for sustainability, but not, not like in the bleeding heart. We need humans are bad. We need to save it. People forget. I'm, I'm going to rant for a minute, but it's my podcast. So I guess I can People <laughs> forget that before we develop technology, the livable area of this planet was the equator and near to it. If you went outside of that, like the original pioneers that went to Canada, they all died. They showed up in spring and was like, wow, this place is great. They had a great summer. And then they all died in the winter because they, <laughs> they weren't prepared. There's so many parts of this planet that we live on. And the only reason why we can live there is because we developed technology to survive in a hostile environment. And so everyone has this idea of earth being like mother Gaia. And I believe to that to a certain point, but at the same time, it's a love, it's a love adversarial relationship where we, there's places we can't live without technology. So I'm very much that we need to find a sustainable way to not defecate in our drinking water, to not fill our food chain with microplastics, like to not deforest the entire planet and create these massive heat sinks. I believe in that. So I just love that this is a, a resource. It's almost like the biggest asset in this is education and the intellectual property on how to use it. Is there a case to use it as plastics? Could I eventually be, instead of having a plastic bag in my grocery store, could I be getting a bag out of human hair? Is that? Hopefully in the future, once we produce those kind of products. How do you do, because you're dealing with clipping. So how do you turn a bunch of clippings an inch, two, three inches long into a, a cohesive a fiber of yeah. a certain of a meter length with tensile strength. Yeah, a big, uh, we have a machine. This is what we got from our partner from the US. So it's actually a felting machine. So that's from Matter of Trust, which in which is where we're part of right now, which are part which we are part of right now. So Matter of Trust is an organization based in California. What they do is they make environmental activities, environmental impact activities across the world. But one of their major projects is actually the human hair, converting right. it for oil spills. So remember my story earlier when I was actually searching online what other countries have started doing it. That's right. where I find matter of trust. Of course, when, when starting a business, we don't have funds yet. So what we did here in the Philippines, we do both bootstrapping. Right. So as much as possible, yeah. we try to partner with different organizations who can help us co-produce the product. Okay. And that's how we contacted Matter of Trust that, hey, we're also starting, we want to start here in the Philippines, the creation of value chain for human hair. Maybe you can help us. So they right. actually provided us with the equipment. And the uh, equipment, for free. It, it uses heat to to does it use heat to cause the fibers to to no one... it's only it's a felting machine oh you need electricity for it to work but it only has certain nails in the machine so once you put your hair it will actually weave or it actually felts the hair oh so regardless it's, braiding, of the size. it's like it's braiding it all together correct essentially correct. got yes. it okay 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 that's super fascinating. I'm that's super fast. My, my step adopted dad developed something and he should have patented it, but he's just such a nice guy. The competitors called and he just gave it away for free. I was dating an, an African Canadian. She was from, she was Nubian and she was from her family's from Kenya and Uganda, but she's grown up in Canada. And I remember we were, she was teaching me to braid her hair in our living room when I was this is like, yeah, I was like 20 a lifetime ago. And my dad watched it and it got him thinking and they would send probes down boreholes for mining exploration. And these probes are like a million dollars to make. And they would lose one every three or five years because the pressure on the cable, it would snap right. and it would, they'd lose it and they might be able to recover it or not. And so what he started doing is he started braiding the cable that it was attached to and they never lost one ever again. And these other nice. companies started calling to try and ask and figure it out. And he just told them, how to do it and gave him the plans. And he was just not very, he was maybe like a Tesla. Give it away for free type thing. But so that sounds like that's what they're doing. They're braiding the hair. They're weaving the hair together. And so now you're having almost an exponential output where the threads of hair woven together like that, braided together like a stronger than even a single strand of hair would be. So I could see how you could create some very formidable like raw materials out of that. That's I'm very fascinated by this. I'm going to keep my finger on the pulse. Thank you. And if you happen to visit in Mindanao, you can also visit our facility sure. with our mothers who is actually working the machine, working sure. with the machine. Sure. So Maybe yeah, they, so at least you can get to firsthand experience how you can felt 
the human hair. Do you have a Do you have a gift shop? I'd want to buy like human hair shorts and t-shirt. This has been a great call. Is there anything I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? I think you've asked everything, but maybe I wanted to add something as well. When it comes to uh, waste management or when it comes to recycling, we always keep on hearing like waste paper, waste metal, waste plastics. Because right now, that's the most common, right? But no one actually cared about human hair. So that's why we actually started this advocacy as well. Because we want to share to everyone that there are other types of waste that maybe right now no one actually cared about. Right. But these actually cause certain pollution problems. And we don't want them to be like plastics wherein we were too late already to try combating it, right? Uh, we already started combating it when it's already in our front already uh, and it's happening. So as early as now, uh, that's why we keep on advocating that as early as now, try to find ways, uh, regardless of what kind of ways is that, try to find ways on how you can actually upcycle it. Maybe that's the next big thing. Maybe that's the next big project you can have as a citizen of your community. So try to find ways to actually make value out of something from this kind of waste. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. If people want to get in touch, if they want to learn more, what are some of the best ways for them to reach out? Uh, You can actually search us in Facebook. It's Kapili, C-A-P-I-L-I. For those who are interested to know what Kapili means, by the way, it's not a family name. A lot of people are confused. They are talking, Harold, are you Harold Kapili? No, I'm not Harold Kapili. Kapili is a Latin term for hair. Oh. Yeah, it's because uh, most of us in the founders graduated from a Jesuit-run university. So uh, Jesuits love Latin, right? So that's why we convert hair into a Latin term, which is Kapili. So yeah, you can search us in Facebook, C-A-P-I uh, Kapili. Or we are also found in LinkedIn and Instagram. So at Kapili Trading Inc. So do some searching for Kapili, C-A-P-I-L-I, Trading Inc. Go take a look. Go learn what they're doing. I love it. Harold, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for coming and sharing this social enterprise innovation. Again, I'm very excited to keep tabs on this and see how you guys are doing and follow up with you later. So thank you. Thank you, Dario. Thank you, Dario. Thank you, Dario. Thank you, Dario. Thank you, Dario.